I'm going to read my blog today because it's a little long. I'll still have it posted, but for those of you who don't like reading long blogs, hopefully this is better. The title, as it says above here, is Radical Constitutionalist. It is what I've been for far more than five decades. And it's not something I coined myself. It's how I was described by others and to others. Back when dissent was considered a dirty word, all right, it still is, back when yanking the United States to forcibly follow and obey its constitution to allow votes for every single citizen to count was greeted with police guns, shooting at their own citizenry. Firemen, which is all they were back then, being recruited to shower us with blow torches of water, forcing us to the floor so that others could beat us up. I grew up in a New York City suburb, a place, part of Long Island, where it was bounded on the east by Brooklyn and Queens of New York City and the Suffolk County farms on the west. My small community was surrounded by Levittown, Wantor, Belmore, and East Meadow, and it was a hotbed of anti-Semitism. My brother and I were routinely attacked. Our windows were broken, and we actually left the town in a hurry because our neighbor told us that they were going to burn the house down that night with us in it. So it shouldn't be surprising that I could understand the problem that black people had with both blatant and secreted animosity, where jobs for them were much harder to obtain, where voting one's choice was never going to be in the offing. But as a, following the role of Hillel, I said, Hineni, here I am. But as opposed to many other young folks ranging in age from 13 to 23, they were protesting the illegal and immoral war in Vietnam, the Southern governments, Northern hypocrisy, and the abandoning of the poor, I really only took issue with the misguided leaders that our country was foisting upon us. I've always been enamored by the Declaration of Independence. To this very day, it stirs me. And our Constitution, for all its faults, that women don't count, that slaves are allowed, they count just a fraction of their neighbors, it's still one of the best blueprints around. But that forced many of my generation to come up with what's called the Port Huron Statement. It was our Federalist Papers, elucidating where change in action were necessary. And I will read to you directly from what it says, not the whole thing, just a small portion. Freedom and equality for each individual, government of, by, and for the people. These American values we found good, principles by which we could live as men. Many of us began maturing in complacency. As we grew, however, our comfort was penetrated by events too troubling to dismiss. First, the permeating and victimizing fact of human degradation, symbolized by the Southern struggle against racial bigotry, compelled most of us from silence to activism. Second, the enclosing fact of the Cold War, symbolized by the presence of the bomb, brought awareness that we ourselves and our friends and millions of abstract others we knew more directly because of our common peril might die at any given time. We might deliberately ignore or void, or fail to feel all the other human problems, but not these two. For these two were too immediate and crushing in their impact, too challenging in the demand that we as individuals take the responsibility for to encounter and resolution. While these and other problems either directly oppressed us or rankled our consciences and became our own subjective concerns, we began to see complicated and disturbing paradoxes in our surrounding America. The declaration, all men are created equal, rang hollow before the facts of Negro life in the South and the big cities of the North. The proclaimed peaceful intentions of the United States contradicted its economic and military investments in the Cold War status quo. We witnessed and continue to witness other paradoxes. With nuclear energy, whole cities can easily be powered. Yet the dominant nation states seem much more likely to unleash destruction greater than all that incurred of the wars of human history. Although our technology is destroying old and creating new forms of social organization, men still tolerate meaningless work and idleness. While two-thirds of mankind suffers under nourishment, our own upper classes revel in superfluous abundance. And while world population is expected to double in 40 years, nations still tolerate anarchy as the major principle of international conduct, and uncontrolled exploitation governs the sapping of Earth's physical resources. Although mankind desperately needs revolutionary leadership, America rests in national stalemate. Its goals ambiguous and tradition-bound instead of informed and clear. Its democratic system apathetic and manipulated rather than of, by, and for the people. 
Not only did tarnish appear on the image of American virtue, not only did disillusion occur when the hypocrisy of American ideals was discovered, but we began to sense that what we had originally seen as the American golden age was actually an era of decline. The worldwide outbreak of revolution against colonialism and imperialism, the entrenchment of totalitarian states, the menace of war, overpopulation, international disorder, super technology, these trends are testing the tenacity of our own commitment to democracy and freedom and our abilities to visualize their application to world and upheaval. 36 years later, those words, by and large, still ring true. But I was able to manipulate and talk and convince many of my friends and others in our groups that our institutions, the courts, the Congress, our government structures, our schools, were not the problems per se. The misguided, those who want to control and steal those institutions for their or their cronies' personal gain, those were the ones we had to stop. So I will skip over, at least for the very short moment, the corrupting and destabilizing menagerie that the Donald is foisting upon this great nation. But I lament the loss of honor and integrity of the grailed old party that surrounds him. The party of Lincoln, Teddy Roosevelt, Nelson Rockefeller, Chuck Percy, Ed Brooke, and Ralph Casey. No, those guys weren't perfect. Sorry, Charlie, no one is. But they believed in the American ideal, to be that shining city that would beckon the world to our shores. Of course, nobody paid a lot of attention to where that term came from, that it was invented by the less than benevolent John Winthrop, and he wanted to replace the city that holds my heart, Jerusalem, with Jerusalem. Many of us do not consider the fact that Winthrop was about as benevolent as Jim Clark. And if you don't know who Jim Clark is, today's day to look him up. He was the sheriff, the malicious son of a bee, who sat there and attacked the peaceful marchers from Selma to Montgomery. And you know, that's another institution our government subverted. Today is not Martin Luther King Day, although that's what we're celebrating, because his birthday was last Thursday. The institution of holidays that celebrate events is no longer true. We don't celebrate the holiday of Lincoln on the 12th of February, or the holiday of Washington on the 22nd, but whenever. Memorial Day is no longer May 30th, but it became a three-day holiday. How can we revere institutions if we let our government subvert historical context for political convenience. You know, it's just the same way here also that our, my generation disparaged the troops coming home from Vietnam. But most of you don't recognize why. That war involved U.S. troops in a variety of massacres. The indiscriminate bombing of villages. Subverting amoral chemistry into immoral deluge of napalm on the countryside, but especially upon the people of Vietnam. That lying to the American people about the status of war with inflated kill counts, that was perfectly acceptable. And maybe now is a good time to remind ourselves that for the past two decades, that's exactly what our government's been doing about Iraq and Afghanistan. So in this longest blog ever, I'm asking you to consider or to reconsider the institutions that make this country great. To work with reasonable people and remove the canard that corporations are people too which just affords them the right to buy our government leaders to do their will, to create laws with teeth that will make it impossible for a governor of Virginia to have his criminality dismissed because our ethics laws are a joke, where it would be impossible for the Donald to profit from foreign governments and corrupt corporate leaders, giving him thinly described bribes by frequenting his marquee brands, or where... Three governors, there's plenty more across this land, but I'll name three. Governor Justice, that's his name, of West Virginia, Hogan of Maryland, and Scott of Florida, as opposed to J.B. Pritzker of Illinois and the former governors of Virginia and West Virginia, Mark Warner and Joe Manchin, that split away and didn't really create blind trusts. But moreover, like the Donald, these governors have installed family members to control the arcs of power within their states. And what about the Donyans minions removing all mention of climate change repercussions from government databases or firing folks that maintain the scientific basis of our government? But the creme de la creme was this past Friday when the National Archives, look it up, say it again, 
realize what I'm saying here, that the National Archives felt obliged to use Soviet-style censorship to blur and blot out signs from the Women's March so that the Donald would not be embarrassed that the march was a response to him, his lack of geography knowledge, and his total lack of history information. He has no idea what places in this world are, or even why Pearl Harbor was the place for him to visit on December 7th. The U and outcry that happened this past weekend forced the National Archives to correct this latest mendacity. But we still have to stop the Donald from stealing from money from critical military projects to repair the homes, the daycare centers, and the schools we provide to our troops and their families as we send these men and women overseas to fight wars, leaving their families with rats, with vermin, with sewage, leaking roofs, just so the Donald can wall us in, protecting us from non-existent hordes and stealing private land to suit his whim. You know, the wall he promised Mexico was going to build for us. And while we're at it, where are those super patriots that took great issue with my generation and our attitude towards the troops and are completely deaf, dumb, and blind when Donald calls military generals running our Pentagon losers, idiots, and babies? At least my generation labeled the troops involved in the massacres war criminals, just as we Americans labeled the Germans for those actions they did in World War II. Our institutions, before the Donald's minions subverted them, actually had their stuff aligned with the Constitution. Law enforcement was not the protection of Donald personally. Educating our children was not promoting religion or business interests. Serving the poor, which means SNAP, is it, which is at least as much a benefit to our farmers as it is to the poor. Where ALIC, the Koch lobbying group that forces state legislators who take their money to sign an allegiance to them and not the people that elected them to write the laws that the Koch brothers tell them to write. Before that, our institutions' processes provided templates to accomplish the tasks needed to keep America great. The institutions need ethical folks, not like Rick Perry, who had no idea of the name of the agency that he was forced to lead, or even what functions it was supposed to accomplish, with the knowledge to guide their teams, yes, teams, to a better American life. We want to trust our institutions, at least until Ronald Reagan, whose goal was to destroy the non-military portion of our budget, so he starved the non-military portion left and right, hoping that it would not fulfill their mission, and therefore you would follow his canard that the government is not here to help you. We want to trust our businesses, and we did so until Marty Friedman convinced corporations that there was no more social compact. They don't have an obligation to their communities. They don't have an obligation to their employees, to their customers, or even to their stockholders. We want to trust our professionals, at least until the big six accounting firms got so greedy and clouded by the money they were getting that they lost sight of their prime mission to ensure the records corporations provide tell us the truth and their, their true and accurate reports to their stockholders. We want to trust our military, which means they have to tell us the truth about the wars, both legally declared and illegally, that we fight or plan to fight, regardless of the political exigencies. It's these failures of ethics and integrity that are degenerating the core and soul of America. We don't need folks attacking the institutions from within, but working within them to accomplish the missions before they were subverted to steer America into a great future. And since today's supposed to be a day of service, that's what I wanted to bring to your attention. Thank you for listening.